Good morning. It's so nice to see everybody here on such a jury day outside. Um, but hopefully there'll be some wonderful talks today to make it worthwhile. So what we're talking today is about eastern box turtles. Um, very prolific species here on Long Island. We see them a lot. I know I, my beagle likes to discover them in my yard occasionally and announce it to the neighborhood. Um, but we do pick them up quite often. So with turtles overall, we have about 11 species of freshwater or land turtles in New York. There are additional um, sea turtles and also one species of, that live in the brackish waters. And we have five of those species here at Brookhaven that have been documented. Um, the five species are the stink pot, which has been documented once or twice, I believe. They have the snapping turtle, the painted turtle, the box turtle, and the spotted turtle. Thank you. <laughs> Overall, uh, turtles are found throughout New York State. They are, however, slow growing. They do take a lot of time to mature, and they take a number of years to reach sexual maturity, and it does provide them with a little hindrance in keeping their population numbers higher. And in recent years, studies have shown up to 30% or more decline in the turtle populations. So we're talking specifically about the eastern box turtle today. Uh, the genus and species is Terrapine carolina carolina, and this is a terrestrial turtle. It's not always found by water here at the laboratory or in other places, but it does like to favor the fields, some of the forest, and the wetland areas around the site. They are diurnal, active during the day. They can usually be found sunning themselves out in a nice spot. They are most active usually between May and October, and we see variations to that really having to do with the weather. We've seen them early um, March and even late into November moving around before they find, a, find their final spot they're gonna hang out for the winter. And they are freeze tolerant, so they just become an active hibernate, dig under the duff layer, bury themselves under the leaves, and they're able to sustain themselves over the winter periods. Overall, they're about four and a half to six inches long on the shell, um, and have a lot of different color variety to them. Turtles are a real long-living species. Eastern box turtles, on average, they say in the wild, will last between 30 to 40 years. But there's been some wonderful documentation, specifically down here in Mastic. Um, I believe it was, was federal uh, park land that discovered this, where in 2002, they had picked up a turtle that had been previously marked. And after doing some research, they found out the turtle was marked back in 1920 by Nichols with a marking system. And at that time in 1920, he had declared the animal to be about 20 years old, counting the rings then. So the animal was pretty much 100 years old back in, uh, back in 2002 when it was refound. They do take about five to 10 years to reach sexual maturity. The males are slightly different from the females physically, so you can usually tell by the color of the eyes. The males tend to have a nice red color eye. Um, you can see a little bit of red here. Okay. Um, the color of the shell and the skin can vary as well. And then the other way to tell is to look at the plastron, the bottom portion of the shell. It'll be concave on the male, and that assists it in being able to mount the female to reproduce. The females tend to have slightly duller color eyes, usually a yellow or a brownish, and the plastron is flat on the bottom. Overall, the plastron's really interesting because it's hinged, and it's hinged right in this area and it allows the turtle to close its shell to provide protection. The animal can pull in its limbs, um, pull its head in, and it's a great deterrent for predators. The diet for the Eastern box turtle is really diverse. They are an omnivore. They will eat whatever they can find for the most part. A lot of the literature cites things such as the raspberries, strawberries, and mushrooms um, that can be found, slugs, worms, snails. There's even reports they'll uh, feed on carrion, so dead birds and dead mammals that they can find. Predators mostly prey on the nest and the eggs themselves. That shell really protects the animals and they're not highly predated for it. So dogs and raccoons specifically we find a lot of here on Long Island. Raccoon numbers are booming and they quite uh, have a knack of finding these nests early, digging up the eggs and consuming them or destroying them. Foxes are also known to go after the nests, as are skunks and snakes. For New York State, the eastern box turtle has been given the label of species of concern. So there is interest in it. They are watching it. There has been a population decline. So we really need to keep an eye on the species to make sure the numbers don't fall too far down. Internationally, the IUCN has given it a label of vulnerable. 
So they recognize the species has some trouble, has some issues that need to be overcome um, that is not completely secure in its areas. And the question really becomes why? Why is the species at risk? This is a long-lived species. It's a species that does well protecting itself. And it comes down a lot to humans in reality. Pet trade is one of the major problems. These turtles are, you know, you can find them going out in the woods. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're fairly easy to pick up and handle. They can be picked up and sold as pets in pet stores to the public. Unfortunately, most animals that are taken out of the environment that way do not survive or live long um, when they're made into a pet. Habitat loss and fragmentation has been another huge problem. Home ranges are being cut off. Inability to get from one area to another to mate. Animals that become isolated, they may not have the resources they need to survive those many, many, possibly 100 years. And when you start having this fragmentation, that fragmentation is being caused by roads. So cars, as many of us know, as we drive around in the springtime and early summer, it's pretty typical to be looking at and seeing at the side of the road a box turtle that's been run over at some point by a car. Um, depending on where you live, you may have this problem of running your lawnmower and not realizing that there's a turtle in that grass that you've let get a little bit high. So turtles can get hit by lawnmowers the blades will break the shell and kill the turtle or leave a mortal wound. They're also very slow to reproduce, so as their numbers dwindle, it really takes them time until they can start to rise, that make the population rise again. And they only lay about four to seven eggs on average, and many of those eggs are getting predated, so we don't have the recruitment in the population to help sustain the numbers. Overall, they're pretty abundant here, especially on the East Coast, up out to Mississippi and even beyond. There are four subspecies of box turtle in the U.S. and additional two in Mexico. This orange is actually the Carolina Carolina subspecies, and that's the one we have here. And we are pretty much towards the northern end of the species range. And this is a map looking at the species range, specifically in New York. This came out of the New York State Herp Atlas, a wonderful document. Um, and shows pretty much on Long Island, it's been known to be fairly abundant. And then as you go up a little further upstate. One of the first things we started doing with turtles um, actually goes back to 2003 when we started marking turtles. And many people do this. It's common when you're trying to do a research study to mark the turtles in a way that you can identify them again. And the way we do that is by marking its scutes. So the edges of the shell here you can count these, they are distinctive little panels, so to speak, on the shell. Um, and we count the numbers left and right, starting from the head, going back towards the tail. So looking at this, we would have one left, two left, three left, four left. And then we do the same thing, one right, two right, three right. And what we do is create a pattern of numbers and letters representing each of those scoots that we can use. It's a unique pattern to identify individuals. And using whether one mark or four marks or more, we can create pretty much an infinite number of marks and unique identifications for these animals. So after we've kind of picked a pattern, we'll take a triangular file and we make these little V notches, if you can see those, in the shell. So this one has one at 2L, so two left, two right. And if the picture showed all the way around the other side of the animal, you would see there's also one at uh, 11L. So that's how the animal is then named. 2L, 2R, 11L. And this does not hurt them, it doesn't injure them, but even as they grow and as their shell expand, um, grows with them if they're young, those notches will remain visible and allows a great way to, for long-term identification. All this information is then taken back and put into our database that we have. And we're looking at a variety of things, weight, uh, location, we're trying to uh, guess the age as best as possible by, by counting the rings. Some of these rings you might see are visible here. Okay. Um, so we'll estimate the age. We'll also uh, measure the carapace. We'll measure the plastron and take some other basic measurements, try to determine the sex. And then we can also look at, hopefully, at recaptures later on. The other thing we'll also do is if the animal has showing any signs of being sick or injured, um, for a while they were picking up a lot of turtles who had an, like an ear infection type. Um, they were being taken to a rehabilitator so they could be put on antibiotics and then we were brought back and they were released back in the area that they were found in. 
So overall, since we started marking in 2003, we've had 364 box, box turtles that we have marked. Now, it's been a very uneven effort. Some summers, we had students coming in specifically looking at box turtles, so we had you know, a lot more turtles added on to the list. Other years, we were unfortunately tied into other research projects. Turtles were not our priority that year, and therefore, um, we didn't have as many. When it comes to recaptures, we only have about a dozen or so. They are not found and recaptured often. Um, we make every attempt when we see one to pick one up now and m look for those markings on the scoots, um, but there aren't many. Overall, for all these animals, we have captured everything from a hatchling up to an animal that's over 30 years old, and the lines now were too smooth to really estimate an accurate age after that point. So you can see the lines better on this picture, I believe. Okay. And after a while, these just start to smooth out, and they're really indistinguishable. So we feel we have many individuals that are actually older than that. Trying to figure out the average age is about 20, give or take, based on the ones we can identify. And they pre are pretty much found all over site, not just in wet areas. So a couple of years ago, we started specifically looking at the turtles in the sense of doing a radio telemetry study. Since mark and recapture really doesn't have the numbers of recaptures to really look at home range and how much land, how much area they're using, we need to turn to telemetry to get a better understanding. So in 2011, we started our study with just six turtles and six transmitters. And at first, we took a variety mix of male and females. Transmitters were put on the back of the turtle, and we tracked them for the summer and into the winter, the fall months when they started to hibernate. Then an interesting came about, thing came about where Tim was looking at this, and you know, this is how the manufacturer says, you know, hey, put the turtle here on the back, it won't interfere. And Tim started a question, is that going to interfere? And chances are, yes, it might actually interfere with mating. The male would not be able to actually mount the female because the transmitter's in the way. So they actually started to add the transmitter here on top, so it was out of the way and didn't impede reproduction. And those transmitters are just held on with an epoxy that will eventually, you can break away and it doesn't uh, hurt the shell. So we put out these transmitters and use a receiver and a Yagi antenna to go out and find them as often as we can. The goal has been, especially recently, at least twice a week during the height of their moving. So really from June to September, maybe October, getting out there twice a week. That's not always possible. It takes a lot of um, manpower or in our terms, intern power to go out there and be checking on these turtles all the time. And then during the winter months when they're inactive, we try to get out there once every couple of weeks just to make sure they haven't moved and that the transmitters are still working and they haven't died off during the winter. So overall, for the last three years we've been doing this, we have used 38 different turtles during that time. Um, seven of them were males, 31 were females. The reason why it's so skewed to being females is we're working in cooperation with um, Dr. Russ Burke at Hofstra, and he's specifically looking at females for some of his research. So we've compromised, and he's helped um, providing transmitters. We increase our numbers that way, and yet we can both get data that we need. The reason for the 38, even though we're not tracking 38 during any one year, is basically because transmitters die, transmitters fall off, we can't always find the turtle again to put a new one on. So we have had to um, let turtles go, essentially. We haven't been able to refine them, and we've just put the transmitters on new turtles. So 2011 was a small effort with only six turtles tracked. 2012, we had 26. And again, in 2013, we had 26. So how does this break down for our three-year period? Well, 20 of these turtles overall have only been tracked for one year. For whatever reason, maybe they were, you didn't have the transmitters or a transmitter fell off. We can only track them for a year. We had 16 turtles that have been tracked for two years, and we actually had two turtles that have been tracked for all three years. And our goal now at this point is they're getting very good, especially the interns going out and finding these turtles and preparing for winter to make sure that the transmitters won't die on us over the winter season until they become active in spring. So what we're doing now is taking all this data, they go out with the receiver, take a GPS point of the location, put it into our database, and we're developing um, home ranges. And one of the easiest ways to do that is the minimum convex polygon, which essentially is just a fancy way of saying drawing 
a polygon around all the points where the animal is found. So if we take all the exterior points and draw a line around it, we get our convex polygon. And this has been one of the original and one of the most popular ways that home ranges have been developed for the last 60, 70 years or more. So what have we found? We, we're doing all this work, we have all these interns working. What we're finding is great variety. This is actually the home range. These are all the turtles that have been tracked, all 38. Okay? And each color represents a different year. Uh, if you're wondering, 2011 is really hard to see because the home ranges were so small in those six animals. There's one here and one here. And I think the others are so small, they're barely recognizable um, compared that year to other years, but they are there. But there's a great variety in how much area these turtles need. Some turtles really are homebodies. They go into an area, that is it. They don't do have much movement, they don't have much range. Other areas, our interns make jokes that they're running after them um, week to week because they're moving so quickly from one area of the site to the next that it's hard to keep track of them. You know, these transmitters only have a limited range and these kids are running around constantly trying to find where some of them are going. Uh, the best example is here, 3R, 3L. You can see how large of a home range it had this past year, even larger than what it had the year before. So there is a great variety. Excuse me? How many acres? Um, that is about 12 to 56, so about 40, 40 plus hectares. It's not acres, it's hectares. Okay. So overall, if we combine all this data, what are we looking at? Well, we looked at a variety of things that are gonna affect the data. Number one, we gotta look at the times the animal was tracked. Not every animal has been tracked the same amount of time and that's just because of level of effort year to year, availability, transmitters fall off. So on average, each of our turtles is tracked about 35 times for the analysis. Um, in 2011, we had very small home ranges. These are all in hectares. So we had about one uh, hectare average, and the range was really from less than half an hectare to one and a half, a very small, narrow. But we only had six subjects we were working with. In 2012, when we expanded to 26 individuals, home ranges expanded greatly. So on average, we had about nine hectares, but the range was fairly large. Everything from half an hectare to 27 hectares. Okay. Great variation. And again, in 2013, we saw even greater variation. Home range stayed about the same on average for about nine, well, almost nine and a half. But our, again, our variation was from 0.8 to over 42 hectares. And if I had to guess, I would say that maximum was the one I was just talking about on the previous slide. So really, there is a great variation seen here. But what, is the, these, what does this all mean? These are all numbers to most of you, I'm sure. Well, on average, we are seeing something slightly above what the average uh, or the mean home range is that has been published. These are a list that came out of Dodd 2001, his book publication on uh, box turtles, showing some of the other research that's out there. And they've seen everything from, you know, one to six, almost six, uh, 0 0.3, seven, one. One found 18.8 to be the average home range. Um, but the real thing I got out of this is the ranges that they were finding with on all these studies. And the ranges vary greatly, and they actually had one that had almost 60 hectares as its home range. So even though we may be slightly above average when it comes to it, we are well within the normal range that has been seen in published materials. We did want to look at male versus female to see if there's a difference, how the males, how much land they need to use, or how, much, uh, home, how large of a home range the females needed. In 2011, there was very little difference. We had a fairly even number. It was two males versus four females. There wasn't much variation. In 2012, again, we were slightly skewed, well, greatly skewed to the uh, female side for samples with only five males and 21 females. Their average, though, was about the same. They were both about eight to eight and a half to nine in here. Okay. But again, their ranges weren't too far apart, two or 0.5 to 20 to 27, still fairly close. 2013 is when we really saw a distinction between this, but our numbers, we actually lost one male on a uh, transmitter and picked up another female instead. So we had four males for our sample size and 22 females. 
And for males, we ranged on average about three hectares. And for females, they ranged 10 and a half hectares. And the ranges were greater again. So as you can see, you have a range of one to four and a half and a range of 0.8 to 42, that one individual who really likes to move around on site. So great variety. It's not able to say that males tend to use more area from females, really because we have such a small sample size, we don't have an even sample size to look at this. If we were to have a more even sample size for this past year, it's possible this bar would be further up here. So this is what we saw in 2011, fairly close. 2012, again, fairly close. This is the average home range size. And in 2013, we had that discrepancy, but it may be explained by our sample size. We also wanted to look at disturbed versus undisturbed. So for what disturbed we are essentially looking at is the Long Island solar farm. Okay. It began construction around 2010, finished at the end of 2011, and has since been recovering and vegetation has been coming into the area. So we wanted to see how the animals act this new disturbed area, whether they avoid it, do they come into it, how do they behave, how do they incorporate it into their home range. So we broke the turtles into three different groups. The first one was adjacent. So these were turtles that were next to the solar farm but had not been documented coming into the actual fenced area. The next was uh, turtles we labeled disturbed. They had been found within the solar farm either for their first initial capture or at some time during their tracking, they had come back in. The last one was our control group, and these were animals that were not near, adjacent, close by to the solar farm, but were on other portions of the laboratory property. So again, our sample size was a little more skewed uh, than we'd like, but you pick them up when you can and put transmitters on them. Uh, when we look at 2011, it's very hard to look at, there's very little data. 2012 is slightly interesting. We have um, adjacent and disturbed do use more than the undisturbed. So you have nine and 10 hectares of land for animals that are in the disturbed area and only seven hectares of a home range for animals that are in the controlled areas or the undisturbed areas. Okay. And that continues a little bit more into 2013. In 2013, we saw the animals that are immediately adjacent to those areas really jumped up uh, and went to 13 hectares, while the animals, again, that are inside the solar farm or using parts of the solar farm stayed around 10, and the animals in the undisturbed areas were about 8 hectares. Overall, we also looked at distance traveled during that time, we, by just connecting the points in order, and there really wasn't much difference in how far the animal traveled, it's just whether or not they expanded outside of, and how much area for that home range. They all moved about the same. So now I'm going to spend some time and give you some idea of what the actual movements are. So these are maps showing our GPS points for these individual turtles. And the polygons are the minimum complex po convex polygons, so the home range of the individual for that year. So this is a male that was discovered. It's on the west side of the property. It was in 2011, so one of our originals. Okay. And for his home range, he fairly pretty much did like this corner and these sandy roads that are here. They're unpaved roads in that area stayed there. And again, in 2012, this male really expanded his home range for some reason. He came around and shot down to this other area of forest twice and then rebounded back up, but really stayed in the same immediate area for the majority of his time. Uh, this is another male who was found in the solar farm. Finding turtles in the solar farm initially is actually very easy. The guys who are out there uh, are mowing occasionally, once or twice during the year, and they're really great. They're, when they're mowing, they stop, they pick up the turtle, put it in a bucket, and give us a call. We got more turtles for you. So we've gotten calls of four to five or more turtles during a day, um, and we'll go out there, pick them up, mark them, and re-release re them to the same area. So this individual was picked up just on the northwest corner of the solar farm. And you can see, I have the dates on here, so you can see kind of where it's kind of traveling tends to spend June right here along the road, and then starts to move around a little bit into some wetter areas, back down into the forest, until finally coming up into some red maple or oak forest to spend its winter, and unfortunately, um, the transmitter was lost off that turtle. 
No, it wasn't, sorry, my apologies. Um, 2013, we tracked this male again, and this male had a slight shift. Okay, so, so going very close, a little further east from where it was, the original solo farm, this male moved away. Okay? It stayed loyal to this area up here in this red maple area in the oak forest, but now came and ventured down in July right on the edge of this unmowed field for a venture, not sure why, but then moved back into his regular core habitat. So comparing the two years together, you can really see the, this core area stayed the same for him over those two year period. And I believe they're still tracking that turtle now. Uh, the last location was in November before we, we cut off doing data collection for this presentation. This is another male, very small area, very core central location. All the points were found fairly far together. This was in 2011. 2012 started to expand his home range, move around a little bit more, but still kept his immediate core home range area. This is another male, again, it was picked up within the solo farm. It was picked up right along here. Okay. And in 2012, really wandered around in a great area. Um, came up, came outside, back out beside the solo farm, hung out by some ponds, came back down, went in the solo farm, came back out, and stayed in that area. And in 2013, stopped wandering just quite as much. So stayed to a more central core area. One of the interesting things we're finding about is the turtle did, though, return inside the solo farm. So there is some viable habitat. There was a reason for him to go back in there. And it's all about the same time period of June where they're returning inside the solo farm. I believe this is our last male. Again, he was picked up inside the solo farm in 2012. Okay. Went for a jaunt for in the solo farm and then took off for the most part. So in July, August, September, he headed for the woods, and I don't believe he ever came back in, at least not that year. Yeah, he was only a one-year track, unfortunately. This is one of our first ski males. She's down off of a road, a paved road. It's not a major thoroughfare, there, uh, thoroughfare through there, but there is some traffic down there, and she sticks more to the wooded uh, areas. There's red maple um, in there, oak, scarlet oak, that she's hanging out in, but she's a very core central area, as we see. I think she's one of the two that we've actually tracked for three years, so we get really good data. And we can see there's a shift over her three years, but again, she has this nice core area where she hangs out. So if we look at all three together, you can see she really is dependent on this area for her home range. This is another female we picked up just outside of our building. Um, once she was picked up, Mark and give it her transmitter, she hightailed it out of the area and never to return, uh, hung out in the forested area. An area, there were many of them tend to uh, hang out towards overwinter in the same time of habitat it looks, and that's something that an intern is looking more at, is what area do they require, what kind of habitat are they using, utilizing for overwinter. And I believe that was the only time we saw that individual transmitter died or fell off, never to be seen again. This female was very interesting and caused much grief over the course of a summer. She was picked up over here at the edge, northwest edge of the solar farm. For whatever reason, the sandy road, soils, habitat, this area is great to find turtles right in the June time frame. Uh, then, right in the beginning of July, she just up and disappeared. Nobody knew what happened. Everybody assumed the transmitter died. And while looking for other turtles, they discovered her in October, happy as a clam, up by Zeke's Pond. So from June, uh, July to October, she just booked it up to this new area and stayed there. Now, the great thing was we did look at her again this past year, and she did the same exact thing. After spring came, she started running back to the same area again. She was found in June, right off of this main uh, the north section of area one of the solar farm. And then after a couple of weeks in June, exact same thing, she started running right back up to where she had spent her wintering months again. So the question is, is this a great nesting area? Is this an area that she needs or utilizes for a specific reason? And this area down here, they have found some nests in 
of the last couple of years that they have been looking at it. So there may be something specific about that area that they need to return to. This is another female that was just uh, looked at this year. Again, kind of a similar thing. We're picked up in June, stays in an area in June, and then goes back up to a different area for the rest of the season and into the fall. And that area itself is actually planted white pine, not wonderful habitat you'd think. But This is another female we were able to track for two years, ventured into the solar farm once or twice occasionally, but right adjacent to it, fairly decent home range. I'm very loyal to this an area again, nice sandy dirt roads that run through the middle, seems to have no problem with that, and likes to stay on both sides of the roads and just in the general area. This turtle did something similar to the same thing we're seeing with the other females, all coming down to this general area in June and then shooting back up to a different area to spend the rest of the summer and into the fall. Again, repeated the same behavior. This is the same individual the following year. So there's something very specific about that area in June, where probably breeding time, or where they're laying their eggs, um, where they need to come down, and then they return back to their normal home range. This one just looks like the other one we showed you, and it does the same thing. The individual went from this area of the solar farm and shot up to the pond again. Same time frame of movement again from June up to later on in the year. So what is this really telling us? We're seeing some really great distinctive patterns start to crop up of the animals moving, where they're using for nesting. That certain time in June, they're all showing up along these, these great sandy dirt roads. Um, and it can tell us a lot and give us a lot of information on areas that maybe we want to protect, areas we want to do management with. We can learn a lot about vegetation preferences. Um, how are they doing on these roads? These dirt roads don't seem to bother them at all. However, we know out in the real world, outside the gates, we have paved roads and a lot more heavy usage of the roads and as a problem. We're looking a lot at, ha uh, at overwintering habitat. Are they choosing these specific places? They keep returning to the same ones year to year, and yet they're moving quite a bit of ways to uh, possibly lay their eggs. So what is so different about them? What makes them distinctive that they keep returning and going back? and ultimately can help us lead to having critical areas of protection possibly. So we know we can help do, uh, do as much as we can to assist as they try to reclaim their numbers on site. And I'd like to acknowledge there have been so many interns who have worked on these projects over the years from picking up turtles and marking them to tracking them every day during the summer through some pretty garbagey looking uh, greenbrier and bayberry and all kinds of things out there. Um, and of course, all the others who have helped over the years. And I'll take any questions if I have time. Yeah, I had a question. Um, before the solar farm was put in, what was there? Do you know what the habitat was like? Maybe there was some vernal ponds in there or something like that, or some sandy uh, spots for nesting. Uh, I know sometimes uh, box turtles in the spring go to uh, vernal ponds to mm -hmm. feast on tadpoles and stuff. So. There were no ponds in that area. There's the one pond that was there was protected, and the solar farm was built around it with access um, that's not fenced access, so they could get around through the vegetation. Um, the main section right there, nor the north end of one, where you kept seeing the maps, that was um, some oak forest, a section of oak forest. A lot of it was old planted farm fields that had gone fallow. They had been used over the years in experiments with the biology department growing corn and stuff and had gone fallow. Um, it really varied greatly. Certain sections of the solar farm were different things over time. With the variation in home range size year to year, have you looked at any environmental correlates with that? Weather patterns or rainfall or anything like that? Not yet. We are looking at, um, we're hoping to look at some of that in the future. This is actually becoming a huge data set and we have probably at least two more years of tracking that we're going to incorporate into this. 
and we do want to look at weather. I know Tim recently installed these great little thing called I buttons that you can actually install on the turtle itself, just like a transmitter, but very small. And it will record the temperature and the humidity of everywhere the turtle is every 15 minutes. So we can really get more of an in-depth idea of other specific requir uh, requirements for temperature humidity that, or areas that the turtle's favoring due to the weather. But we do want to amass the weather for the last couple of years and seeing if that patterns of dryness or patterns of rain do influence the movement. Jennifer, excellent presentation. Thank do you have any idea what fraction of the turtles you've captured? What would be a population density, for instance, in the, the total home ranges that you would expect and what fraction of those did you get? We, I have not looked at that yet and I don't know if that can be really determined because home range for turtles are not very territorial in the sense of other animals and mammals uh, that I'm more familiar with. So um, there's a lot of overlapping of home ranges. So I don't know, I wouldn't even know where to begin yet to really come up with a total population. Um, we may do better with just some of the, taking some of the MARC data, putting it out there into one of the programs, MARC, um, and try to come up with the number eventually. But right now, I couldn't even make, hazard a guess as to what it is. Yes, uh, George Costa from uh, Tribe Unlimited. Uh, two questions, one, uh, some reptiles, when they lay their eggs, of course, the uh, offspring of sex are dependent on temperature. Is there mm -hmm. any information known about the turtles themselves? Um, for turtles, yeah, sex is dependent on temperature. I believe the warmer it is, it's females for box turtle, and some, there are some herpetologists who can correct me in this room. I know there are. Uh, but I think it's warmer. We haven't looked at that yet in any, I don't know if we're going to. I don't know if that falls more under uh, some of the reproduction work that Dr. Burke is looking at, so I'm not sure if he's going to be looking at that. And are you also taking DNA samples on the turtles? No, we're not at this time. Okay, all right. Are you? And uh, just another note, if you're interested, I happen, about two years ago I happened to be in my backyard and I do have box turtles, quite a few of them, small ones and large ones, and I have pictures of them mating if you're interested. <laughs> okay. We actually get quite a few of those ourselves. The interns come back and say, yeah, I found both of the turtles in the same spot. And it's like, well, take a picture. You never know when you want it for a poster or some other presentation. So. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you for your presentation. You. Um, Jennifer, I live in Huntington. A lot of development going on there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of curbs now being put in. In the last several years, I've had several box turtles have been hit by cars, um, severely injured. You know, is it, if I find them on my property, is it worth moving them? I'm told it's not a good idea to move them. Everything I've seen in the research says you really shouldn't. They have, you know, they will continue to try to return to their home, natural home range. Mm -hmm. They will go back to the area. And if you bring them too far away, they are very focused and driven on returning, and it could be very detrimental to them trying to get back. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.